Once again, good evening and thank you so much for, for joining us. Isn't it good to see the, the limitations lifting and we're just coming back to church like it is supposed to be. And you know, James found himself in a very similar situation. That's what we're gonna continue speaking about tonight. The book of James, we've informed you that we have this series. We're unpacking the book of James and I was thoroughly blessed by the word last week and it set a great platform for us to continue to allow God to speak to us. That's really what's happening when we read the Word. We really are allowing God to minister to us. And so I believe that you will be blessed tonight. I want to thank Apostle Theo and Dr. Bev for the opportunity that I have to break bread with you tonight, to share the Word with you. And uh, I trust um, to watch God just move in a wonderful way in your life and in mind, you know, when we speak here, it's amazing what God does in your own heart, just as you are sharing the Word. His Word is full of life and living power. Amen. How many of you believe that? His Word is full of life and living power. Let's pray. Father, we thank You tonight that, that we could continue to look at the book of James, a key person that You selected, You handpicked him, Father. You moved in his way in such an incredible way in his life in such an incredible way and, and uh, inspired him to write this letter of James to the church, to us. Already so far back in the past, you already knew about what we would face today and how important your word would be to us today. And so Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, Spirit of God, for taking this word, planting it deep in our hearts and causing it to produce a harvest even many years from now because your word is alive and we thank you so much father for giving us life through your word in Jesus name amen, amen. so we're talking about the book of James and and tonight I'm actually going to continue on from where pastor Andre left off he started in chapter 1 he dealt with the first portion of chapter 1 where James was speaking to and he writes in verse 2 that he's speaking to the scattered church because that's what they were in those days. They were scattered. They were not able to gather as churches. And that sounds very familiar to what we've experienced over these last 13, 14 months, is that the church found itself to be scattered in a way, and, and not just physically, but we also found ourselves to be scattered spiritually. And emotionally, there was just a whole bunch of things that we had to uh, uh, get used to. And, and the world was you know, just in an instant turned upside down and you know, what used to be normal just seems so strange to us all of a sudden. And that's a lot to have to deal with. James found himself doing the same thing with the church, but God inspired him to write this letter and to share things with the church. And even today, that word is true and it is alive and it is as relevant today as, was it, as what it was when he wrote it those 2,000 odd years ago. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the rest of chapter one for you. I'm just gonna read through it first. You can follow with me on the screen for those of you that are watching from home or in our other venues, uh, or you can follow in your Bible with me. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach on a couple of elements from chapter one as we bring uh, get a clear picture of what he was saying in this first chapter. So it starts, I'm gonna continue reading from uh, verse 16 out of chapter one. It says, don't be deceived. He starts after speaking about trials, and temptations, which is what we learned about last week. He's dealt with that, helped us to understand what's the purpose of a trial. God uses that, He, he grows us. We should rejoice in trials because it's good for us in a way. And, and we got a much better understanding of that. And then we know that temptations are not from God, but that's the enemy's way of trying to destroy us. So he's dealt with that and he begins and he says, don't be deceived. Now, the reason why he would say that is because this is obviously, obviously an area that is not always clearly understood. So let's see what people can easily be deceived by. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father 
of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. So God is not like a shadow or a light that changes and moves around. He's firm and solid and, and um, you know, he, he never changes. Something that you can always put your trust in, the fact that God never changes. He says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. And I'm gonna pause there. Because what I want you to notice, folks, is as I read through the rest of chapter one, you're gonna hear James referenced the Word and the Word of Truth, which really is the title of my message tonight, the book of James, the Word of Truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits to all that God created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, he says. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word. There it is again. Planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word. He speaks of it again. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, there it is again, but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, what does he do? He goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the fifth time that he speaks about God's word, that gives freedom. Tonight, I want you to know as we celebrate freedom that God's word gives freedom. Can you say that with me tonight? Say God's word gives me freedom. And so he continues in it after having seen himself in the mirror, right? It says, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. So what they've seen in the Word, they do what they've seen. The Bible says that they will be blessed in what they do. You wanna be blessed in your life? The Bible gives you the solution right there. Check out the Word, trust the Word, do what the Word says. The Bible says that you will be blessed. And it goes on to say, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep the tight rein of their tongue That's another area that we're gonna be delving into, not tonight, but in chapter three, we're gonna talk about the tongue and and that's gonna be a really great uh, teaching to help us to tame our tongue and keep it in check. So it says to tighten the rein on their tongues, deceives themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. And so he tells us to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So five times James mentions the word. He talks about the word of truth. He talks about the solidity of the word. And he says, don't be deceived at the power that the word has in our lives. That's the message that he's trying to get across. The word of God in our lives has great power. We should not be deceived to think that it is any other way. Then he says, like the Bible, he says, it's like the Bible really is important. That's the point that he's trying to make. What God says really is here in printed form. But this is what God says. It might feel like a book, but it's not. It's what God says. And he says, if you really have the right attitude towards the Word of God, it has the power to anchor you in the middle of your life, even when it is scattered, even when you don't know which way to turn or when we may not be directed on which way to turn. James is saying that the Word of God is so important. He speaks about it five times in the rest of chapter one. Now, folks, if there is any one thing that you do in the middle of a crisis, is that you stay true to the Word of God and that you are reading it. It's no good on the coffee table or in the shelf. We have to be reading the Word. And if there is any time where we should be doing that, it is now in what it is that we are facing. We need to believe the Word because all throughout the Bible, it says how God's Word anchors you. Say that with me. Say, God's Word anchors me. Just think about an anchor for a moment. No matter how wild the sea can be, that ship remains secure because it is anchored. To be anchored means to be fixed to something solid. And you are dependent on that thing that you are fixed 
to. It's a foundation for our lives. And I think, if we can all, I think that we can all agree that the one area that is under direct assault of both culture and the devil, it has to be the Bible. For centuries now, the, the Bible has been under attack, even more so today, because the world has gotten cleverer, if you know what I mean. We've now learned so many things and, and you know, the world is really at our, it's at our fingertips. And you know, whatever it is that you're looking for, you'll find it. And the world so in itself has become deceived because it thinks that it knows everything. It's concerning and it should be concerning to all of us because people don't know the Bible. They're not reading it. A lot of people don't even believe it. They say that it, it is flawed and that, they are, uh, you know, that the, the word contradicts itself. And we know that this is not true. But you know, it's so convenient to believe the next professor that tells us that you know, the Bible was written by the church as a form to control people and they come up with all sorts of theories and stories and, and, um, and we know that that's not true. But for someone who really is looking for an alternative, they would quite easily want to believe something like that. They wanna believe that maybe the Bible isn't God's word because it's, it's gonna restrict me. And I'm gonna show you today, we saw the scripture says that the word brings freedom. And so James says that don't be deceived. People think that there's no freedom in serving Christ to the point where they've become deceived about it. Yet freedom is in the word, freedom. This is where our freedom lies, is, is in the word. So, uh, you know, they believe that it's flawed and, and, you know, the problem is that when you relax your attitude towards the word of God, that's where the devil can come in and destroy you. I mean, he's been wanting to do it for, for, since the creation of the earth. I mean, let's just think about the first words that the enemy spoke, the first words that, that Satan spoke. Goes all the way back to where Adam and Eve were in the glory of God. They were in the beauty of God, the tranquility of God, living the life that God had purposed for mankind to live. Right back in Genesis and in chapter three, verses one, the devil comes in the midst of all of that perfection. And what does he say? The first words that come out of his mouth is, did God say, already attacking the word. And I believe that what he says here sets the spirit and the tone for what the enemy's work would be in our lives forever. His agenda really is to steal the word, always questioning the word, always challenging the word, doing whatever he can to steal the word. Like Jesus warned us about that says that he immediately comes to steal the word. That's his modus operandi. And he, he revealed that secret back in the Garden of Eden already. The single most important discipline that we need in the middle of a pandemic is what he is after. And sadly, we live in a generation that thinks that they know more than God. Picking and choosing what they like and, and what fits with their lifestyle what works for the way things are in the modern age. I mean, you know, God didn't understand the relevance of what we're going through when he wrote the Bible back in the day. That's how, our, that's the, the state of our generation today. They follow their feelings too much. How many of you would agree with that? that? If it feels good, then let's do it. I mean, after all, God wants me to feel good. So if he wants me to feel good and whatever it is that I'm doing makes me feel good, then come on, it's gotta be right. Let's just go with that. But God, you know, God wants you to be happy. He wants you to feel good. But you know, he's more, he's more concerned with you being holy, folks, than how you feel. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 16, verses 25. I mean, nothing is new under the sun. Doesn't the Bible say that there's nothing new under the sun? Check what it says back then already, there is a way that seems right to man, but what happens in the end? It leads to death. So James is urging us to consider the Word of God, to treasure the Word of God, to realise that the Word is vital in our lives. You know, the thing is that uh, people who say, you know what, I, I don't really believe the word. You know, it's not, it, it doesn't work for me. I've heard that before. How many of you have heard that before? That really is, is just speaking out of ignorance or, or out of convenience. But the thing is that uh, what we need to understand is if we go through a life, people who, who, who choose to go through life without the word 
what will happen is that life will teach them. It will be the hard, the school of hard knocks, but life will teach them that you can't have success in this life without the word. Just think about this for a moment, just for a moment. The root of morality, not killing our neighbors if we don't like the way they drive, we just shoot them or you know, we, we just go off and, and do things just because we feel like it. The whole idea of morality is from the word of God. No matter what it is that you believe, you can't run from the fact that God has put that in place. So what James is saying is that, he's saying once you understand the difference between a trial and temptation, he wants us, uh, he goes on to say that we need to have the right attitude. So know what comes from God, what comes from the enemy, that, that every good thing comes from God, and that he, he, he starts by saying, don't be deceived in thinking that, you know, God is boring and, and you know, he's, he can be a bad God and a good God. God can't be bad. God can only be good. Nothing bad comes from God. That all comes from the enemy. He goes on to say that we need to have the right attitude towards the Word of God. Because if you have the right attitude towards the Word of God, guess what happens? You actually have the right attitude towards God Himself. So here's what James is saying. He's saying, what is going to be the basis for how I live my life? Is it gonna be the world and my way or is it gonna be the word and God's way? What's going to be the basis for how you live your life? Psalm 119 verses 81 shares something interesting about David's life. To us, it says, my soul, this is Psalm 119 verses 81. It says, my soul is weak, from waiting for you to save me. My hope is based in your word. So here's what I want you to see over here. Number one, I don't know if you're aware, but Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. There are 176 verses in the Psalm. And you know, every verse deals with the word, talks about the word. The longest chapter in the Bible dedicated to the word to the Word. Why? Because the Word carries so much importance. And, um, and so David found himself in a very difficult, or the psalmist, let me rather say that, found himself in a very difficult situation because he says that my soul is weak from waiting for you to save me, almost frustrated in a way, almost as if it looks like God is not there for me. I don't know if anybody's experienced that before. When you go through something, it looks like God is not there. And, and it's difficult to have to be in, in those sort of positions. But this is what he says. He goes on, but my hope is based on your word. So he's saying, even though it looks like you're not even there for me, you're not gonna come through for me, or listen, I'm waiting here for this breakthrough. He says, my hope is in your word. You see, folks, the thing is this, we can't always control what happens in our lives. And I'm talking, uh, uh, let me talk about 2020. I mean, because uh, it is so relevant uh, to what we're experiencing today. We couldn't control what was happening just last year. That's just a few weeks ago. And, um, and even what has spilt over into this year, we don't have any control over that. But what we can change is we can change our attitude towards what we are going to be like in the middle of a storm, just like the psalmist. Though it appears that God is not there for me, my hope is in your word. That talks about their attitude towards the word of God. And there is no single greater discipline to surviving the middle of a crisis than the word of God. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter seven, verses 24. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, uh, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus is saying that, uh, you know, you're not going to fall if you have the word as your foundation. Yes, storms are gonna hit your marriage, they're gonna hit your family life, they're gonna hit maybe your place of work, they're gonna hit all spheres of life. But he's saying, if it's founded on my word, if your, word, if your life is founded on my word, you are not going to fall. Say that, I'm not going to fall. God places His word above His name. His goal tonight 
is for you and me to love His Word, to love reading it, to love believing it, and to have the right attitude about the Bible, to see it as a life-giving source, to see it as being pure. Because family of God, it isn't a book. This is God. We can actually have a relationship with the Word. How many of you have a relationship with the Word? You love reading the Word and, and it speaks to you, hey? And, and you treasure the Word. So, James gives us three attitudes that I wanna share with you concerning the Word of God. Three things that he believes we should have as an attitude towards the Word of God. The first one is that we should greatly, uh, excuse me, we should gratefully receive the truth that saves us. The words in this book are what saved you. I know Jesus saves us, but that story was put in the Word. That's how God, and we'll see that in Scripture, that's how He chose for our salvation to come, through His Word. And so uh, uh, what James is saying is that we should gratefully receive the truth that saves me. In, in chapter one, verse 16, he says, don't be deceived. Again, we forget that God is the source of all that is good. My dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift from above comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Church is not boring. Christianity is not boring. It's not a case of, you know what? All right, I'll give my life to you, Lord. The journey along this life for me to get into heaven is not gonna be moilik and it's gonna be difficult and painful, but I'll do it in any case because I wanna spend eternity in heaven with you. That's not what Christianity is about. And I'm sure people get into that rut. And that's the deception about it. When I was growing up, I mean, I've been in this church my, really my whole life. But there was a time as a youngster where, where I really felt like uh, uh, Christianity or being a Christian was gonna be laborious. Not was gonna be, was laborious. It was painful. It actually felt like a duty to me, like cleaning my room. To be a Christian felt like I had to clean my room. I just did something that I had to do. It wasn't something I enjoyed doing, but I had to do it because it was the right thing to do. But that's not what Christianity is. God wants a love relationship with us. And so uh, we shouldn't see it as a duty. We should see it as an absolute pleasure. And, uh, and I believe that's what's happening tonight to some people who need to just have that, that renewal of their minds. It goes on to say, who does not change like shifting shadows? He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. I'm gonna read that again. God chose to give us birth or to give us the born again experience through the word of truth. So what, what is it that I want you to grab a hold of is that if you treasure your salvation, how many of you treasure your salvation here? How many of you, it's valuable to me. I mean, I, I wanna preserve it. I wanna look after it. It's, you know, I value it. If you, the way that you treasure your salvation is the way that we should be treasuring the Word. And it's speaking to me too. I think me more than anybody else here. Because that's how important the Word is, that our salvation came through the Word. And then God says that, that we might be a kind of first, first fruits of all that He created. Think about that. Now, I wanna just quote Romans 10, 17 to you. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing how? By the Word of God. So I declare to you tonight that some are going to hear the Word and conviction is going to come and you're going to long to have a different attitude about the Bible, about the Word. When He talks about first fruits, it's so important to God, the first fruits. He said he gave us birth through the word of truth so that we can be a kind of first fruit, his first fruit. So in those days, you know, the people understood the first fruit a bit differently to the way we do because, um, you know, most of us, we don't make our own commodity and sell them today. But in their days, they, you know, they made their own commodities and they sold them, they lived off them. It was very valuable to them. And they would sell it and, and what would happen, the first fruit, they would take the first part of what they toiled during the day and night and, and, and looked after. They would take that first fruit and bring it to God. But it wasn't, as a, it wasn't a difficult thing for them to do. They brought their first fruit as a celebration to God to say, thank you, Lord, you've made it possible for me to grow these crops and, and to live off of these crops and to, and to sell them. It wasn't a case of, gee, I've got all this corn. You know, I was gonna sell everything and get a really good price because the stock market price right now in, in, uh, you know, back in those days is really good. But now I have to give some of it to the Lord. No, it was their joy to do that. That's really where the tithe came from. It was all about the attitude. 
And so God sees us as a kind of first fruit, his first fruit. Think about Sunday being the first day of the week and we give a portion of our week to God. We start off the week with church. We're saying, Lord, before my week even begins here, I wanna give the best of it to you. So in a way, we are giving God a first fruit of our week. I like that, I, I like that very much. So the guy growing corn, he didn't see it as a burden. Uh, he was honoring God with his first fruit because he's saying, thank you for the ability that you gave me to grow this corn. And I wanna give you the first one. Why? Because you gave me your first and your best. So it's all about an attitude change that James is trying to get through to us. Secondly, he says that we must humbly accept the truth that confronts us. Humbly. Why would he have used the word humbly? I've spoken about it already because a lot of people today have pride because of what they think is true. They read the Bible and think, well, obviously God didn't know 2020 was gonna be our, our modern age. So what he wrote was only relevant to back then. That's not how we do things today. That's not how we see things today. That's not how we live today. So it doesn't really fit in our culture today. So he says we must humbly accept the truth. In James chapter one, verse 19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Listen, yeah. Quick to, <laughs> listen. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. How many of you live by that creed? I certainly fail on all three elements. If we look at ourselves, honestly, I, <laughs> I'm not making the cut because human anger, he goes on to say, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Not beating around the bush on that one. And the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Humbly accept the word. Don't just take the word for what it is. In fact, I'm gonna go to the third point. The third attitude that James tells us that we should have concerning the word. Listen to this. It's to intently embrace the truth that guides us. So it's the word that saved us. We should treasure it. Secondly, we should humbly accept it. That word accept is like accepting a stranger into your house. You don't even know what the conversation is gonna be about. You just trust uh, that everything's gonna be okay and you're gonna have a good time uh, you know, meeting with the stranger. So you have a decision to make. You open the door and you, you receive them into your home. And, and in the same way, that's what he means when he says accept the word like you would a stranger. Even if it's gonna slap you, well, the word rather, if it's gonna slap you a little bit in the face, you have to humbly accept what it is saying. And then thirdly, as I said, intently embrace the truth that guides me. Intently, he used that word on purpose. To, be, to intently do something is to do it with intent. In other words, there is a deliberate reason why you're doing something. You want to, you want to see what God has to say to you in the Word. He spoke about the Word being like a mirror. Some of us, the Bible says, when we look into the mirror, we think that we're great and we're cool and everything's hunky-dory. And then when we look into the Word, the mirror reflects back to us and we see, yep, I've got hair out of place. You know, I, 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 my, I haven't done my, my, my face if you're a lady. Maybe you've got a hanger coming out of your nose and, and no one in your family is bothered to tell you about this four inch hair that's protruding from your nose. The Bible shows us that. And, and then uh, even though it shows us that and we humbly accept it, we still have to make a decision to, to make the change, to do what the Word says. So the Bible will show you those hairs that need to be clipped. The problem is that not everybody, because the Bible says we walk away forgetting what we just saw. Yay. Forgetting what we just saw. So too many people are ducking without plucking. They're, 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 they're seeing what the Word says and they're leaving without taking the time to actually allow the Word to change them. So intently embrace the truth that guides me. Let me give you some practical ways in which we can intently look at the word, like, like Peter, when he went into the, you know, when he went to the empty tomb, when he saw the tomb was empty, the word that the Bible uses that he intently looked inside the tomb. He didn't just walk past and say, oh yeah, I see the tomb's empty, lacquer. He actually went inside and had a look around. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? That's what that's talking about. So how can we practically 
be intent about looking at the Word. Let me show you, uh, let me give you some ideas here. Number one, get a paper Bible. Technology is awesome, but get a, a Bible that you can treasure and make your notes in. Because that's the second point, is that you should set time aside to read and study and meditate on the Word. Think about the things that you're reading. That's the intent. Don't just read it because I need to ease my conscience or, you know, I have a habit of reading the Bible. I know it's a good thing for me to do. Think about what it is that God is telling you. Have a Bible reading plan. Have some sort of direction on where you're going. Sometimes I think, for me, sometimes I wouldn't read my Bible because I actually wouldn't know where to go and read. I know it sounds crazy and, and probably I'm the only one. But if you have a plan on how you're gonna get into the Word, it just makes it that much easier. And then lastly, don't just read the Bible. Let it read you. Let it be the mirror that God says that it is. Have a look in your Word and say, well, what, kind of, what am I gonna see about myself today that you want me to look at, Lord? that you want me to change, that you want me to improve on. James so desperately once wanted the people because he had the urgency in his heart, prompted by the Lord. Don't be deceived. The Word of God is our treasure. It's what we live by. It brings us freedom. It is our anchor. It's the only way that you make it through a storm is through the Word of God. I wanna pray with you right now. Would you mind just to uh, bow your heads and close your eyes? I wanna pray just concerning what I've spoken about here this evening. Father, I thank You that every person, both here in person and, and watching from wherever they may be, will tonight fall in love with the Word. I pray, Lord, that we become a church whose lives and foundations are built on the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that we live in freedom because of Your Word and that the enemy will not steal the Word from us, Father. That we are not those that are deceived, Lord. Thank You for helping us to have the right attitude about Your Word. Thank You for causing us to fall in love even again with Your Word. Father, help us to welcome it Welcome Your Word into our lives and, and humbly accept what it tells us. Thank You that just as You saved us through Your Word, You continue to save us. In other words, look after us in this world because of Your Word and we treasure Your Word tonight. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Praise God. Well, with every head still bowed and every eye still closed, I said to you tonight that the Word is a person. It's God. Jesus is the Word. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And we read tonight in the book of James that God chose for us to be born again through His Word. And so if you're here tonight and you've never had an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, to receive this Word, this life, I'd love to pray with you tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you wanna make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you wanna begin to have a relationship with this life-giving Word, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand at the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now and be sure of your salvation. Jesus died for that. And so I wanna pray with you for those in the venue as well, in the various venues, Raise your hand. We have, uh, we have a host over there that, that's seeing your hand. And, uh, and we, just wanna, we just wanna pray with you. And, and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right now. For those of you, in fact, I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this prayer together with me, okay? But those of you that raised your hand, I want you to think about what it is that you're saying right now, okay? It's a simple prayer, but mean the words that you say. Let's say this, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son Jesus, who you sent to die for me. He took my punishment on the cross so that I don't have to. Tonight, I declare that Jesus is the Son of God and that He is risen from the dead. And I give my life to you humbly 
tonight, I give my life to You. Thank You for saving me. Right now, according to Your Word, I am a child of God. Praise God. Well, congratulations to every one of you that gave your hearts to the Lord this evening. What a wonderful transformation. And it's just a miracle really that has happened in your heart. So uh, um, I'm gonna hand those of you in our venues over to your host right now. And uh, for those of you here in the auditorium, if you gave your heart to the Lord uh, tonight, I wanna ask if you wouldn't mind doing one more thing for me. If you wouldn't mind just taking your belongings and going to the back of the auditorium, we have a dream teamer who'd like to just take a moment to connect with you and, and in fact, take you to our connection center and just share with you what are the next steps that you need to take. You've just given your heart to the Lord. You wanna know what it is that you need to do next because there's a life that you're gonna live as a child of God. And so we wanna help you with that. For those of you uh, that are uh, streaming in live, if you've just given your heart to the Lord, congratulations. Uh, welcome to the family of God. Won't you please go to our website. On uh, our website, there's a yellow box. You can't miss it. It says next steps. You can click on that and you will, if you just follow the prompts, you'll see uh, what it is that you need to do. And uh, I wanna just uh, uh, remind you that we have prayer taking place tomorrow morning. Uh, we continue with our weekly prayer at 8 a.m. on our Facebook page live. Please join us with our prayer tomorrow morning. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you're here for the very first time, our guests, thank you so much for joining us in the Connection Center. We just wanna spend a few moments with you and uh, answer any questions that you may have. And folks, I wanna ask you to stand right now. Thank you so much for uh, enjoying the service with us. Come on, let's give God a worship before we go our way. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.